Hi, my name is Colleen Willard, and it is so wonderful to be back here at Moore Abbey in Ireland. I want to thank God, first of all, for allowing me the privilege and the honor to be able to bear witness to all of you that are here, to the healing power of Jesus. So many times in our lives we think that he's not here among us. Well, the testimony that you're about to hear is one that will attest to the truth that, yes, God does heal. Many of you have probably gone to Medjugorje, and it was there that I received a healing in the year 2003, September 3rd to be exact. And the Mother of God, Mary, Queen of Peace, has been continually drawing souls closer to her son. And I'd like to start this evening off with you by reading one of the messages that Our Lady has left for not only you that are gathered here in the church, but for all of you that are listening on this tape now. And she says to each and every one of you, Dear children, today again I am calling you to complete conversion, which is difficult for those who have not chosen God. God can give you everything that you seek from Him, but you seek God only when sicknesses, problems, and difficulties come to you. And you think that God is far away from you and is not listening and does not hear prayers. No, dear children, that is not the truth. When you are far from God, you cannot receive graces because you do not seek them with a firm faith. Day by day, I am praying for you. And I want to draw you ever more closer to God. But I cannot, if you don't want it. Therefore, dear children, put your life in God's hands. I bless you all. Thank you for having responded to my call. Those words may seem something maybe that you've never heard before. But it was words like that that penetrated my heart and brought me along this incredible journey, a journey that saw me as a wife and a mother of three sons. I was married, still am, almost 30 years of of married life to my husband, John. And it was a journey of suffering, one that I never thought I was going to have to deal with. But if you'll join me, let's take this journey together, closer to our Lord Jesus. In September of 2001, I had to undergo back surgery, something that I thought was going to be very simple and easy. Life was going just as I thought it was. I was a working wife and a mom and doing all the things in our family life that probably a lot of you have already experienced, you know, running here, doing the shopping, everything. And then all of a sudden I started to experience some terrible back pain, and I went into the doctor thinking, you know, that they would just go ahead and take care of it, and I would go on with my life the way that I knew it. Only I didn't know that that was going to be the start of an incredible turn of events that would dramatically change my life forever. The doctors had diagnosed me with a herniated disc on the L5-S1 area. Now, I don't know if many of you are familiar with that, but that's in the lower back. They had told me that, yes... With a herniated disc, they could go in and do surgery. In about six to eight weeks, I would be back working again. I had worked for 13 years at a school with children with disabilities. And again, I thought it was something I'd be going back to so quickly. Well, they went ahead and they did the surgery. They said it was successful. They had gone in there. But there was only a few problems that were seeming to come up from nowhere. I had difficulty walking. We lived in a house that had two stories, so I could not take the stairs. The next thing I know, I was at home with a walker and unable to climb. So they brought in the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, and rather than getting better back in six to eight weeks, I I was getting worse. In fact, so bad that one morning, I was in such excruciating pain that I wasn't even able to call out to my husband, John. And he came downstairs in the family room, which now, rather than being a family room with a couch, the TV, everything in it, had now been converted into a sick room 
with a hospital bed being brought in. And he came downstairs to see me in this grimacing feature that I was in. And he went ahead and went to grab for the pain medication to give it to me and give me a glass. And I could not even take my fingers around to grip the glass. He went ahead and he called up the doctor and she said, get her over to the hospital right away. So the paramedics picked me up and they brought me over to the hospital. They had to literally turn me side by side with the sheets because I could not even take my body to roll from one end to the other. I had absolutely no idea that was what was going on. They started to do multiple testing, everything from not only blood workup, but to a, a CAT scan to just about everything I could ever imagine. By the time they finished with all the testing, again, John and I are just thinking maybe this is a little bit of a hurdle that we have to go through, but they'll be able to find a solution. The doctor came into the, our room at about 10.30 at night, and that's when we first started to hear the bad news that was going to, as I said, start to change our lives forever. She went ahead and told us that, yes, the surgery was done. Um, our clinic, by the way, is having some financial problems, so we're going to be closing. And by the way, I will no longer be your doctor. I mean, when we start to hear that, we think, oh, no, what's the next thing? And then as she's flipping through the paperwork and she starts giving me all the test results, she goes ahead and says, oh, by the way, did you know you had a brain tumor? And this hit John and I. Out of left field, from nowhere, we thought a brain tumor. What is she talking about? I thought I was dealing with something just, you know, back problems and some sort of pain syndrome that was going on. But now, all of a sudden, I was told that I had a brain tumor. She went ahead and kind of shuffled it off and said, oh, don't worry, there'll be another doctor here to tell you about it more tomorrow. After she left that room that night, John and I looked at each other. We thought, no. We've got to find a solution. If they have to go in to operate, well, is it something I could live with? What? So we went ahead, we left the hospital, and we went and started to pursue not one, two, three. It was almost like five different doctors. Now, we lived in the Chicago area, and they have absolutely fantastic teaching hospitals there. And as we started to make appointments to go to other neurosurgeons, thinking they'll just go in, they'll do the surgery, or tell me, you know, what options I have, one of the doctors in particular that I made an appointment with, I saw her on TV the night before the appointment. I went ahead, I said to my husband, I said, oh, this is really great. I said, this is a good sign. I said, here's a doctor that we're going to see tomorrow. I said, and they have her on TV doing brain surgery. I said, John, this is going to work out great. Well, we get into her office. She goes ahead, takes a look at the MRI results, comes back in and says to me, Mrs. Willard, I'm sorry. She said, I cannot operate. Trying to get your brain tumor out is like taking bubble gum off tissue paper. It's inoperable. I heard those words, and they penetrated me like nothing before. We left that hospital, and we went ahead, and we went to another one. That doctor also said that it was inoperable, and this continued through all the way to the, all the Chicago hospitals that we went to. Finally, John and I wound up at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. At Mayo, when we went up there, within 24 to 48 hours, they were able to find things that some of the other hospitals were not. They wound up doing every single testing on my blood, my bones, my brain, every part of me. And, and by the time they had finished, they brought John and I in for the final discussion. They found out that I not only was suffering with an inoperable brain tumor, but by the time Mayo Clinic finished with all the diagnosis, it was somewhere around 14 diagnosed illnesses, diseases. I had everything from adrenal insufficiency to osteomyelitia, a word I had never heard about. In fact, they had asked me if I had ever been to a foreign country, and I said, no, why? And they said, Mrs. Willard, your body is so filled with rickets from head to toe, we normally only see this in a malnourished country. They said, your body is not absorbing any vitamin D from the sun or from the food groups. And then the list went on. And John and I could not believe what was coming 
into our ears. They said that I had Prince mental angina, pulmonary problems I had with breathing, metabolic bone disease, lymphedema. I had no feeling in the left toes, three of my left toes on my left side. I had what they referred to as a left foot drop. And then on top of it all, being racked in 24-hour chronic pain, they said that I had one of the worst cases of fibromyalgia that this clinic had ever seen, and they're world known as having the top fibromyalgia clinic in the world. Those were only some of the major diseases. I had difficulty swallowing. I had to be placed on steroids, on morphine. The medication was so much that I think it was over 30 different types of pills I was taking a day. When I asked them about the brain tumor, what, what was it that we were to do? They agreed with the other doctors that it was inoperable. They told me that my tumor was sitting in front of the hypothalamus gland right next to the major blood vessels. They advised me that if there was any doctor that said to operate, that I needed to ask this question, would I come out the same way as I did before? And the answer would be no. They informed me that if the tumor continued to grow and depress into the hypothalamus gland, it would shut everything down in my body. Or the other option was that I would die of an instant aneurysm. The neurosurgeon looked at me and he said, Colleen, your brain tumor is located in your soul. <laughs> I looked at this doctor and I said, wait a second. I'm Roman Catholic and I know where my soul is at. I said, it's not in my brain. I said, I don't understand. And he went ahead and so kindly, as compassionately as he could, explained to me that my tumor was located in the very center of the brain that regulates your heart, your lungs to breathe, your blood to pump everything. And the only recourse that we had was that they would continue to monitor the tumor and treat me with the medications that could help sustain. John and I went back to our hometown, the suburb of Chicago, after a five-hour drive from Mayo Clinic. And I walked into that family room with a hospital bed set up realizing that between the nurses that were coming in to help me to endure the, the pain that I was in, I couldn't walk anymore on my own. I had to be assisted with, with canes or picked up out of bed. John and I looked at each other and thought, what are we going to do? The bills were already surmounting, unlike anything that we had ever come into. And as many of you know, doctor bills, it, it, in a second, it seems like they can be in the thousands and thousands of dollars. Well, as John was talking about possible solutions, he knew that he could not quit his job. I needed to be under constant care. I could not be left home. There were times when the paramedics were called out to the house so many times because of the Prince mental angina. And we started to think, okay, do I need to go into a nursing home or what? Our children were growing. We, Kyle was a freshman in high school. Christopher had already finished high school and was starting off in his college years, and our oldest one, Brian, had finished school, and he was already out on his own. And as John and I were talking about the options of what were left for us, I heard Christopher say, Mom, Dad, there's no choice. I'll quit school. I'll stay home and take care of Mom. I looked at my son saying this. I said, No, Christopher. I said, we'll find another solution. And John and I continued with our conversation. And he interrupted us, and again, he said, Mom, Dad, he said, there's no choice. He said, I'll stay home, and I'll take care of Mom. And I heard my son saying this. And as any of you mothers out there know, all that we want for our children is the best in life. I didn't want to see my son giving up the life that he was just beginning to take care of his 50-year-old mom, one who no longer could even function on her own whatsoever. But as he continued to say, no, mom, I'll stay home. I'll take care of you. And dad, when you come home, then you can take over and I'll try to find something else. And I thought to myself at that moment when tragedy 
hits a family, it is either going to tear you apart or pull you together. In this instant, it started to pull us together. I went ahead and I said to Christopher, I said, Christopher, do me a favor. I said, go upstairs and go bring the crucifix and put it down in the family room at the foot of this bed. I didn't know what was going on with my life anymore. I went ahead and he put the crucifix at the foot of the bed and I looked at it unlike any other time in my life. Now, I've been raised in a family that had faith. I've looked at many crucifixes along my childhood, and, but not like this time. I went ahead and I looked at that cross and I said to Jesus, I don't know if I have the courage to handle this, but I know you haven't given this to me out of any punishment. I don't know if I have the faith to handle this, but I have the faith in you that you must see something that I don't because I know that you don't allow anything to happen to us more than what you know that we can handle. And all of a sudden, I started to think of my grandmother when I was little, and I'd fall off my bike, and she'd say to me, Colleen, offer it up to Jesus. As a little child, I used to hear those words, and I'd think, what is my grandmother talking about? Offer it up to Jesus. It hurts. But those words came back to me that moment, and I started the first journey of surrender. And I started to say to Jesus, I offer everything up to you. I looked at Christopher, and I said to him, I said, Christopher, do me a favor. I said, open the Bible and, and read me anything that your eyes should glance upon. He opened up the Bible, and he started to read to where St. Paul said that carrying the cross is a joy to the point of folly. I heard those words, and I said to him, Christopher, read them again. And he said, Mom, St. Paul said that carrying the cross is a joy to the point of folly. And I heard those, and I thought, Lord, this is truth. This is in Scripture. There are no lies in Scripture. There must be joy in carrying the cross. And I looked at that crucifix again. And I said, Lord, I don't know why I have this brain tumor. I don't know why I'm not able to be a wife anymore. I don't know why I'm not able to do the things that I used to do. But I embrace this suffering and I unite it with you. Now believe me, there were times when I had to say to our Lord on the cross, I offer up this to you. Over a hundred times, sometimes it seemed like I was repeating it. But I found that the more that I would say it, even as my body was deteriorating, my soul was expanding. As the months and the years started to go on, the tumor was growing larger. And it was doing everything that the doctors had said that it was going to do. It became difficult for me even to talk. If I had a conversation any more than a few minutes at a time, I was short of breath. Pulmonary specialists were brought in to help me, and more medication, more morphine. It was a continuous ending cycle. When we had found out that it was time to get my house in order, I started to think of all the things that I would leave behind for my children, I'd go ahead and I'd take, have someone take my wedding dress and cut it up into baptismal gowns and give it to my children so that when they got married, they had something of me, something of, my gram, of their grandmother to hand down. I started to think of things that I would leave my, my nieces, my nephews, my brothers, my sisters, and especially my husband. And I picked up the rosary and I started to pray. And it had become such an integral part of my life during this time. I went ahead and I thought, 
Lord, I don't know where to go on any of this. As I held this rosary in my hands, I started to think of everything in my life. I started to think of all the good that I had done, and I thought of all the bad. I thought of even the time how we were pulled so much together in prayer when the illness started. And then there was one time when Christopher, who came into the family room, and I don't know why, but I had said to him, Christopher, are you still saying prayers? And he looked at me and he said, no, Mom, I'm not. I was so heartbroken to hear that. I said, Christopher, what are you talking about? How could you say something like that? He said, Mom, I don't even know if there is a God anymore. What kind of God does something like this to someone who I think has done good all their lives? He said, yet there are people out there who rob, who steal, who murder, and there's nothing that happens to them sometimes. He says, that's not my kind of God. And he pulled away from him so much so that he went into Buddha and Hinduism. And it was these rosary beads that I held on to. And I started to think of what the Blessed Mother did. Did she go knocking on the doors all the time of someone who didn't believe in her son? No. She took everything quietly to God in prayer. And that night as I was in that hospital bed, thinking of all the things in my life and, and taking the wedding gown and cutting it up and leaving all these other things that I thought were so precious, the Holy Spirit started to show me, what is the greatest gift that you could leave for anyone, for your children, your family, for relatives, the community that had been praying for me? He showed me. It was the gift of prayer. Because that one Hail Mary, that one Our Father said, would be heard by God and last for all eternity. And I thought, Lord, that's what I want to leave behind. I want to leave this pinnacle of prayer for everyone. They don't even need to know that I'm even saying it. But I wanted something that would be lasting. Something that would be good. And all of a sudden, in my heart, I thought, what would be a pinnacle of prayer? And all of a sudden, it came to me, a pilgrimage. That was a pilgrimage, a pinnacle of prayer. And I started to say to our Blessed Mother after I, I said the rosary, I would love to make a pilgrimage, but I didn't know where, didn't know how. I knew I wasn't in any condition even to do it. It was in 24 hours later, someone came out to my house, and it was a person who had led many pilgrimages over to Medjugorje. And as she sat in my living room, talking about this upcoming pilgrimage, I looked at her, and I said, Oh, I would love to take a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. And Gail went ahead and looked at me, and she said, I know, Colleen. She said, but even though you cannot go to Medjugorje, she said, Our Lady will come to you. And I see this woman taking this necklace off her. It was a little metal that she had around her neck. And she took it off and she walked over to me. And she put it around me and she says, Colleen, even though you cannot go to Medjugorje, Our Lady will come to you. When I was there, this metal was blessed during the apparition. It was blessed by Our Lady, and this is for you. And I thought to myself, wow, how incredible. I, I, I thought immediately of when Our Lady appeared in Fatima to the three children in Portugal, and she had asked for a statue to be made so that it could go to the homes of all those who could not make a pilgrimage. And I thought, here, now I'm receiving a medal that was blessed by Our Lady. It was such a warm, incredible feeling. And that evening, when I was lying in the hospital bed and I, I picked up these rosary beads again, and I started to go ahead and say a prayer, and I was asking Our Lady after the rosary if I could please make a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. I said, there is no way that I could go. I said, I have such a strong desire 
to want to make this for a pinnacle of prayer. But I said, Blessed Mother, there's no way that I could do this unless you plant the desire in John's heart to go. So John came home from work that day, came up to me in, in what was now the sick room, and I said to him, I said, John, I have this strong desire to go to Medjugorje. And I started to explain to him about what had happened to me in prayer. And I said, do you think there is any way that you would want to take me to Medjugorje? And he looked at me, looked at the medication on the side of the bed, and wondered if I had taken an overdose that day, and said, absolutely not. And I went ahead that night. I I started to say the rosary again, knowing that the rosary had the power to go ahead and convert hearts. And I knew that I was saying it to Our Lady. And I went ahead and I said, please, Blessed Mother, I have this strong desire to go to Medjugorje, but I know that I can't make it unless John has the desire to go. I said, please, could you plant the desire in his heart to take me? So John came home from work the second time. He comes up to me and I ask him, I said, John, I said, don't you think you have a little bit of a desire to go to Medjugorje? I said, don't you think you could please take me? And he looked at me and I hear the words and he says, sure. I thought, oh, this is great. I said, my husband's going to go ahead and take me over there. And John, I didn't know it, went ahead and said, I said, sure, because I knew very well we didn't have the money to go. And that's exactly what I said to Our Lady. I said, thank you so much for planting the desire in John's heart to go. I said, I not only have it, but now he does. But we have no money to go. I said, please, if there is a way. And I brought it to Our Lady. Well, I had no sooner finished saying the Hail Holy Queen. And all of a sudden, I heard this so interiorly in my heart. I heard, if you call so-and-so, you will see that there has been money set aside for you in an annuity. This will be the means for you to go. Now, I wasn't used to hearing something so clear-cut as that. But it was so strong that I went ahead took the phone, and in order to even dial, I could not take my fingers to press them down on the buttons. I had to use a pencil because any time anyone would even give me a touch, I had a rippled effect of pain. But this was so strong that I took the pencil and I started to dial, and I thought, how am I even going to get a hold of this guy? It's somebody that I haven't talked to in well over seven years. And so I I thought, okay, he lives in this suburb, I'll, I'll try him there, and I got the operator on the line. And when God wants to go ahead and make connections, believe me, I found out in this journey, he will make the connections. So he goes ahead, all of a sudden I'm connected with this guy on the phone, and I say to him, you know, hi, I said, this is Mrs. Willard, you know, and he went ahead and he says, oh, hi, Mrs. Willard, he said, I heard about your sickness, you know, and I said, yeah, yeah, and I you know, just a little chit-chatting here and there. And I went ahead and I said, listen, I've got this question to ask you. I said, by any chance, do I have any money set up in an annuity? And he said, yes, Mrs. Willard. He said, you do. I said, is that something that I could have right now? He said, with your disabilities, he said, you can have it right away. And I said, well, how much is there? He said, just a minute, I'll go check. So he goes ahead, comes back on the phone, and he tells me, And it was just enough for two airline tickets and have $200 left over for souvenirs. So John came home from work, and I said to him, John, guess what? Our lady provided for us the money to go. And he said, oops, I guess I better get a passport. So on we were to Medjugorje, or at least I thought. We went ahead, and we called the pilgrim leaders up to tell them that we were going to go. Now, we had never taken a journey like this. And then we were informed that in order for us to even make this pilgrimage, we needed to have a doctor's note to sign us off. Now, mind you, in the medical condition that I was in, the enormous amount of physicians that were brought into this case, I thought, how are we going to do this? John went ahead and he says, well, you know, we have an appointment with a cardiologist. He said, why don't we go ahead and see her and we'll ask her. Now, Mayo Clinic was up in Rochester, Minnesota, so we knew we weren't going to be making a ride up there. 
So I went in to go see the cardiologist who was taking care of the heart conditions that I had, and I was on like about four different type of heart medications. So John wheels me in the wheelchair into this hospital, and she comes back in after the testing only to tell me that I, I was filled with lymphedema and some of the other test results that they did wasn't all that great. But at this point in the illness, I found that joy that St. Paul spoke of. It's like it didn't even matter anymore because I found that peaceful surrender. But I went ahead, I said to the doctor along with John, I said, I kind of timidly took this, you know, little piece of paper and I said to her, would you mind signing a permission slip for us to go to Medjugorje? And she said, Medja what? So John and, and I looked at each other and he started to explain. He said, well, Medjugorje is, you know, it's a small little town. Since 1981, Our Lady has been appearing to six children there. And we started to share with her a little bit about Medjugorje. And I see this doctor looking at me, and she's got this straight look on her face. And she said to me, Colleen, are you going over there for a healing? I looked at her and I said, no, I'm not. I know that if God wants to heal me, he can do it right where I'm at. I don't need to make a trip over to Medjugorje. I said, that's not the reason why I want to go. And I started to explain to her, wanting to make this pinnacle of prayer, this pilgrimage. And instead, I got this blank look going across her face. And she said to me, I'm sorry. In all good consciousness, I cannot sign you off to go. She said, you may not make it back. I heard those devastating words because I thought I was following the path that God had asked me to follow. John brought me out to the parking lot of this hospital, lifted me out of the wheelchair, and put me in the front seat of the car. And this time, I did break down, crying. I was so, I couldn't believe what was happening. I said to John, I said, why does God open up a window and close a door? And he says, well, what do you want? We can't go. And I thought I was doing everything that God wanted me to do. I was a wife. I was married. I tried to serve the best that I could, both in my home and in the community. When the illnesses came, I started to surrender everything to God. I started to unite everything to him. I prayed more than I ever did in my life. All I wanted was what the will of God was. And then the desire to go to Medjugorje and the money that came in unexpectedly. And now all of a sudden, I couldn't go. And I said to John again, I said, why does God open up a window and close a door? He said, what do you want? We can't go. And all of a sudden, out of my mouth came so quickly the name of this priest that I knew in Chicago His name is Father Aniello, and he has the gift of hearing our Lord speaking to him like we're conversing tonight. And I went ahead, and so quickly I said to my husband, I said, I want God to tell Father Aniello to call us and say we're supposed to go to Medjugorje, and if that happens, then I know it's God's will. Now, Father had absolutely no idea. I had even wanted to go to Medjugorje. didn't know any of this stuff whatsoever. John goes ahead, he looks at me, he says, fine, why don't you go ahead and call him? And I said, no, I want God to tell Father Aniello to call us and say we're supposed to go to Medjugorje, and if that happens, then I know it's God's will. Well, by this time, John has the car window rolled down. He's looking out the window trying to see if lightning bolts are going to come down and strike us right in the parking lot where we're at because he sees his wife challenging God. But that isn't how I saw it. I just wanted answers. I just wanted answers. So John took me back home on that ride. It seemed like the longest ride of my life. When he tucked me in the hospital bed again, that night I remember I held these rosary beads in my hand. I don't even know if I said a whole decade. But I started to think of all the ways that the Mother of God surrendered to our Lord's will in his life. 
All the times that she said yes, from the time that the angel Gabriel came down to announce that she would be the mother of God, to the time that she saw her son grow into adulthood and the persecution that he had to undergo for our sins. The yeses that she said when she saw her son walking on the road to Calvary. And by this time, morning came. And I said to Our Lady, that's okay if I'm not going to Magigoria. I'll take the money that you've given to me and I'll put some towards the church and I'll put some others to the doctor bills. All I want to say is the same that you said. When you said, I am the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. And I started to think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Father, your will, not mine, be done. And I heard the phone ringing in the background. And there was this incredible peace that came over me after I said those words. But Christopher came in and he said, Mom, you have a phone call. And I picked up the telephone and I said, Hello? And I hear this Italian voice and he says, Hello, Colleen? I said, Yes. He said, this is Father Aniello. I said, Father, how did you know to call? And he said, I was in front of the Blessed Sacrament in morning prayer, and the Lord told me to call you and say, yes, you are to go to Medjugorje. It is God's will and Our Lady's desire that you go. And when you go, you will be resting in the mountains. I heard those words, and I thought that is where God was telling me that I was going to die. But I was okay with that because I found the words of truth from St. Paul. But I went ahead, I said to Father, I said, Father, can you hold the line a minute? I said, John is not going to believe that you are on the other phone. So I go ahead, I take the pencil, and I start to, to get John. I'm saying, oh, please, be at your desk. And he goes ahead, he gets on, and I hook the two of them up together. And Father says the same thing to John. He said, yes, you are to go to Medjugorje. It is God's will and our lady's desire that you go. And he says again, and when you go, you'll be resting the mountains again. It pierces my heart, because I think this is where God's calling me to die. But I said to Father, I said, Father, we need a permission slip to go. I said, and the doctor refuses to sign us off. And out of his mouth, I hear these words. He says, you do have a Polish doctor, do you not? I said, yes, I do. He said, you are to call him. He's from Poland, and he knows of Croatia. He will sign you off. I hang up the phone from Father, and I say to John, I said, John, what do I do? He says, well, call him up. What are you waiting for? So I go ahead. I call the doctor up, and I... I start to explain to him about wanting to make this pilgrimage, this pinnacle of prayer. And the response that I got back was, would you like to have your son come and pick it up, or should we mail it to you? So off we were to Medjugorje. Now, for those of you that have ever gone there, you know what a long, long trip it is. And it wasn't an easy one in my physical state. But when the doors of that bus opened up into this beautiful village, it was like as if God was in the air. And I was so happy to be there because I knew that I had made this journey, a journey that I felt Our Lady was calling me to to make. And on the very first day, we found out that the group was going to go over to one of the visionaries' homes Her name is Vitska. She's one of the six children and still receives daily apparitions herself. And I thought to myself, oh, this will be wonderful. I I get a chance to see one of the visionaries. And so as they brought me over to this, this small little home where the streets are so, so tiny, there were three steps going up to the side of her home. And I looked around, and there had to be at least about 400 people that were so squished into this small area, just wanting to get as close as they could to hear her talk. And they carefully lifted me up the wheelchair and packed me in, so much so that I had one woman who had her legs in between my wheelchair. 
I couldn't see anything. Everybody was just like this. You couldn't even raise your hand. I couldn't even raise my arm if I wanted to. The most I could ever lift my hand was about this high. In any event, as Vitska started to speak, she was on the stairs on the side of her house. And she was telling of one of the apparitions where our Blessed Mother had appeared to her and to the youngest visionary, Yoka. And it was during this apparition that Our Lady had told the two of them that she was going to take them to see heaven, purgatory, and hell. And as she started to speak and started to describe what she was seeing in heaven, she spoke about how Our Lady had held her hand and the other young visionary, Yoga. And she spoke of the beautiful sight of seeing the faces so filled with love, I could imagine. And she spoke of purgatory and how Our Lady had brought them to see the poor souls in purgatory. And I remember just realizing how, how important it is for every single one of us to pray for these poor souls because they cannot pray for themselves. And then she spoke of hell and the vision, the sight that they had seen. And I can tell you from what I heard, if there is any one of you that thinks that hell does not exist or that the devil is not out there, think again, because he is. But as Vitska continued to speak about Our Lady's presence and what she was showing them, especially with heaven, I remember there was such, oh, such a fervent love for Our Lady that was coming out unlike anything I started to feel before. And I said to the Blessed Mother quietly in my heart, because I couldn't see her, all I could see was just people from waist level up. I said to Our Lady, I said, if I could only see Vitska, the visionary, then it would be like seeing you because you took her to heaven. And as Vitska continued to speak, all of a sudden my prayer got a little bit greedier. And I said to Our Lady, if I could only touch the hand that held your hand, then it would be like holding yours because you took her to heaven. And all of a sudden, I heard through the microphone, momento, momento, and I didn't even know what it meant. And I looked up, and all of a sudden, it was like watching Moses parting the sea. All these bodies that were shoulder to shoulder started to separate. And I see Vitska coming towards me, looking at me like I was a long-lost friend. And she came up and wrapped her arms around me and said, Praise God. And I said to her, Vitska, I didn't come for myself, but for all those who ever asked me to pray for them, for all those who I ever said I would pray for, even for those that have seen me from the moment I was a baby in the crib. Please, would you ask Our Lady to answer the desires of their hearts? And I heard her say, yes. I said, you will? And she said, yes. And at that moment, she made the sign of the cross on my forehead. And she placed her hand on my head. And the moment that she placed her hand on my head, I no longer could hear any outward sounds. But it was the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I was aware that there was this intense heat going on in all parts of my head, unlike anything I had ever felt before. But that was secondary to the presence of God. If he would have said, I'm taking you now, 
I would have gone so gladly. I don't know how long it lasted. My husband and all the others that were around had said that she had prayed over me for about five minutes or so. As they started to lower me down these stairs on the side of the house, the presence of God in my heart was so strong. And the heat, the heat was unlike anything I had ever felt before. It wasn't like as if it was a hot, sunny day or, or even a hot flash. But again, that was secondary to the presence of God. They had taken me and lifted me up into the front seat of the car with a, the Croatian guide that was with us at that time, Draga. And as I sat in the front seat, there was this other automobile that had pulled up alongside Draga's car. And I see her rolling down the car window, and she says something to this young man in Croatian. I didn't know who he was. And all of a sudden, Draga turned around, and she looked at me, and she said, Colleen, this is Yoga." And I realized in that moment, Our Lady not only allowed me to hold the hand of one of the children that she took to heaven, but the other child also. And Draga had said, if we leave right now, we'll be able to get to the 10 o'clock English-speaking Mass. And as John wheeled me into the back of St. James on the left side, Mass then started. And as God is my witness, I have never, ever heard Our Lady's voice. But it was right before the consecration of the Holy Eucharist. Right before the priest takes the bread and the wine. And it turns into Jesus. I heard a voice so clearly and so audibly go right through me. And she said, now, will you give your whole heart and your whole soul to my son. And I said, yes, I will. And will you give your whole heart and your whole soul to our father? And I remember there was such an emphasis on the word our. And I said, yes, I will. And will you give your whole heart and your whole soul to my spouse, the Holy Spirit? And I said, yes, I will. And she said, now, my daughter, you are my daughter. And I looked up. And standing right in front of me was a priest with the Holy Eucharist. And the moment that he placed the Eucharistic host on my tongue, the same thing that happened to me when I was at Vitzka's, where I could hear no sounds, happened again. But it was the presence of God the Father. God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I was aware that all this intense heat that had been with me for over 45 minutes was now leaving, and with it, all the 24-hour pain. But that was secondary to the presence of God. And I realized what Our Lady was asking me. To give everything, everything to God. And I thought of how many times I had gone up to receive my Lord in the Holy Eucharist. All the times I had said to him, Jesus, I love you. And I found out there is so much more to the soul that can be given to you. 
I can never, ever receive Holy Communion the way that I used to. But I looked at my husband. I said, John, I'm in no more pain. And all of a sudden, I felt this, this movement in my, in my fingers that I couldn't move them without any difficulty, with any pain. All of a sudden, the, the three toes on my left side that I could not feel, like I could feel movement in them. I could feel movement throughout my whole body. And I said to him, John, I'm in no more pain. And the tears are flowing down from my, my face. And I looked at him, and he was in tears too because he knew that something had happened. I didn't know what I was healed of. All I knew was that the pain had stopped. And he brought me back to the pantheon and wheeled me there and helped me up out of the wheelchair in this bedroom that we were at. And it was the first time that I was able to stand and be embraced by my husband. And I was in no more pain. I didn't know how many footsteps I could take. I didn't know how far I could go. But as everybody was getting ready for dinner that evening, I thought to myself, Lord, could I go ahead and try to change my clothes? Could I go ahead and take one leg out of my pants? Because all this time, I had to be dressed. I had to be bathed. I had to be cleaned. Everything. I couldn't do anything on my own. And I started to do something so simple, like get yourself dressed. And it was then that I made it out to the dining room, and I started to eat. And I realized I could swallow. I didn't have difficulty swallowing. I thought, Lord, could I go ahead and take a few steps on my own? And I put the canes that were there to assist me. And I got up and stood and turned around and looked at everybody in the room. And all of a sudden, I could move unlike any other time in my life. And believe me, if I could have done the Irish jig that night, I would have done it. And the whole room burst out into absolute praise for what God had done. It was later on that night, adoration was beginning. I didn't know if I could even kneel. But the Lord allowed me the gift to be up in front of him and kneeling for over 45 minutes in front of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. The next day, everybody was getting ready to climb the hill of the apparitions, the place where Our Lady had appeared to the visionaries. And I thought to myself, I want to see if I could go ahead and climb. Our spiritual director that was with me on this pilgrimage went ahead and looked at me and said, no, Colleen. He said, I don't think so. He said, you're going to have to stay here. He said, you've had been in a wheelchair for over three years. He said, you've had muscle atrophy, so there's no way that you're going to be able to go ahead and, and climb. My husband was agreeing right along with him. But I wanted so much to make this climb. On top of that hill was a statue of Our Lady. But more importantly, even that, I just wanted to climb the hill. I wanted to climb the hill in thanksgiving to the Blessed Mother. I wanted to climb the hill because I knew that Almighty God was looking down. And I wanted to lie prostrate on the top to thank Him for everything, including the gift of carrying the cross because that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it brought me closer to our Lord Jesus and the crucifix. Well, as I started to make this climb, it's kind of interesting how I was even able to figure out how I was going to get up there because I looked around at my husband and I thought, I don't have any shoes to wear. I came over in a wheelchair. I had slippers. I looked at my husband, kind of eyed his shoes out, and I said, honey, could I go ahead and wear your shoes up on the climb? He turned around and he looked at me and he says, yeah, now for the first time, you know what it's like to walk in my shoes. So there I go. I have my husband's shoes on. The incredible thing is that they fit because my feet had swollen up so much. And I started at the bottom of that hill. But before I made this climb, I went ahead and I said a prayer to Our Lady. I didn't know why I had added this last part, but I realized that the Spirit was asking me to do it then and giving me a prompting. All of you that are here tonight were included in that prayer. And all of you that are watching this tape now are included in it also. 
God had a plan in all this. I didn't know what it was, but he did. But on the bottom of that hill, I went ahead and I said to Our Lady, May every step I take be not only for those who asked me to pray for them, for those who said I would pray for, even for those that have seen me from the moment I was a baby in the crib, and for all those that I meet in the future. As I started to make this climb, I noticed that at times I looked around and my husband was behind me, and I got up to the top. And I didn't care who saw me or what they thought. I stretched myself out totally flat on those rocks, pressed my face into the soil, and I started to thank God for everything. I was down there for some time lying prostrate. When I got up, I saw my husband over to the side of me. I went ahead, I rolled over into his arms. And the two of us lied there arm in arm, looking up into the heavens. And when it was time to get ready to leave, we started to walk down this hill. And we were with our, the spiritual director on this trip, Father Camello. And before we left, Father turned around and he looked at us and he asked John and I, if we would like to have our wedding vows renewed. It was in front of the blue cross that John and I committed our love again for each other. When we reached the very bottom, somebody had a Polaroid camera, and they had taken a snapshot of John and I up on top of the hill. And they said, here, Colleen, this is, this is for you and John. And I turned and I looked at this picture, and I see myself lying in John's arms, resting. And all of a sudden I thought, this is what Father Aniello said. And when you go, you will be resting in the mountains. I thought I was going to Medjugorje to die. And I was okay with that. Later on, the rest of the pilgrims came down and I was joined by my husband and we descended the mountain. And as we started to go back, we were asked to go to St. James Parish to start to give, to let them know what all happened. Now, there were many people that were on the trip that had seen me when I was sick, and they said, you need to go in and tell them what has happened. So in, John and I go along with the priest and others who had been witness to this incredible event that had taken place, and I was told that what I needed to do was to go back to my hometown, go back to the physicians, and go ahead and be retested on everything. Now, mind you, I didn't know what it was that I was healed of. All I knew at that time was that I was in no pain. John goes ahead, and he had already emailed the boys to tell them that your mom is up out of the wheelchair. She's climbed the hill of apparitions and a mountain. And they're all thinking, okay, Dad, you've now gone into mom's morphine. And so while we were there on the steps of St. James, We were told these words. We were told that when you go home, you will see that Our Lady has everything all arranged for you. And I thought to myself, what does that mean? We've never gone through anything like this before. We go ahead. We land. We're at Chicago O'Hare Airport. Christopher, now this is the son who had quit school and stayed home and took care of me this whole time. The one that had pulled away from God. All of a sudden, I'm standing there in an upright position with the wheelchair closed alongside me. I got this beaming smile on my face because of this incredible place where I just came from. And I see the van pulling up, and out comes my son. Now Christopher has dreadlocks down to the middle of his back. And I see him running out of the van, and I see the dreadlocks flapping in the wind. And he comes up, and he throws his arms around me with tears in his eyes. And he said, Mom. I do believe in God, and I believe in miracles. And we held on to each other for the longest time. When we got back home, my youngest son was there. I was greeted with the same. He was seeing his mother standing, embracing him. Kyle couldn't do that before. And the same happened with my oldest son. 
Now our next venture was to go up to Rochester, Minnesota to see the Mayo Clinic doctor. I had absolutely no idea what I was healed of or anything else like that. All I knew was that my mobility was back and I was in any pain. I go ahead, I walk in to see the internal medicine doctor. She didn't even recognize me. She thought it was another patient that was coming down the hallway. This is a physician who could not even touch me or had difficulty even getting me up to even be examined. And all of a sudden, she's able to hold on to my hand, and she said, Mrs. Willard, what happened? I said, I took this pilgrimage over to Medjugorje. And she didn't ask Medjugorje what, so I knew that she knew about Medjugorje. And I went ahead, and I said, I don't know what happened. I said, all I know is that I'm not in any pain anymore. And so John and I started to tell her the whole journey, everything that happened in Medjugorje, from after receiving our Lord, from being prayed over, to climbing everything. And she went ahead and she said to me, she said, let's see what God has all done. And she started to tell me about the doctors that she would line up for me to go ahead and be reexamined. And one of them happened to be a doctor that I had never, ever seen before. And I looked at her and I said, how am I going to be able to go in and explain to this doctor everything that happened? I said, he's going to look at me like I was absolutely crazy. Colleen, don't be afraid to tell them what God has done. Look at those who were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. They were the same ones that Jesus healed. She said they need to hear what Jesus has done. So I walk into this doctor's office that I'd never seen before. I see fish hanging up on the walls. I think to myself, okay, I'll tell him that my father's a fisherman. Then I'll ease in about Medjugorje because I remember what happened the last time. And I see this doctor sitting at this computer at his desk. John and I go to sit down on the little couch, and he's like this, and he says, So, I see I'm looking at a miracle here. I said, Oh, have you been to Medjugorje? He goes, No, but I know of it very well. I said, Have you read a book? He goes, No, but I know of it very well. I said, A video? He said, No. He said, I know it very well. He said, "Um, my best friend is Pope John Paul II's private physician. I know of Medjugorje very well. And then all of a sudden, the words that were told to me on the steps of St. James, and when you go home, you will see that Our Lady will have everything all arranged for you. She did it all right. They went ahead and started to retest everything. All the blood workup, everything, including the MRI. The test results started to come back. And all the things that I had wrong with me, they were all coming back normal. And then the time came to find out about the MRI. Was the tumor still there? When they got the radiology report back, all it showed was a a signal abnormality. I questioned, well, do I need to come back? Because at that time, as the illness was progressing, we were having to go in on a more frequent basis to have everything monitored. And now all of it showed was a signal abnormality. There wasn't even a definitive size that I knew of. Seven months after this first initial testing upon return from Medjugorje, John and I were in Chicago with our oldest son, Brian, and we were having dinner. And I happened to get quite sick after I ate, so much so that John went ahead and as we came back home, I started to vomit really bad. I thought, I didn't know what it was. But it got so carried away that the next thing I knew, I'm about ready to pass out on the floor. And John is on the phone now calling the paramedics, which is the last thing I ever wanted him to do. It was the last thing he wanted to do because he had a life of a husband where the paramedics were out to the house six times in in just a very short couple-week period because of the attacks that I was having. So he calls... The paramedics, they come. They bring me back to the emergency room of the hospital. I'm now vomiting so bad 
And I'm saying to myself, what is going on? I was able to get up and walk in Medjugorje. Everything has been fine. I haven't been sick. Nothing. I've been weaned off medications, things like that. All the steps going back. And now I find myself in the middle of this emergency room, all these monitors, you know, being hooked up and everything else like that. And the doctor comes in and looks at my husband and says, can you tell me what her past medical history is? John goes ahead, he looks at me, looks at the doctor, and he takes out his little notebook pad that he always had any time that we went. He goes, well, my wife has had an inoperable brain tumor. She's had adrenal insufficiency. She's had osteomyelitis. She's had Prince mental angina, da, da, and he starts going down the list. He said, but she doesn't have many more. She was healed over Medjugorje. The doctor looks at him and goes, mm-hmm. She said, your wife could be vomiting like this because she has a brain tumor. She says, we're going to have to go ahead and do a scan. She walked out of the room, and I, I remember looking up, and I just said, John, what if, and I wanted to say, what if they find something that I didn't know I had after the 14 diagnosed illnesses? And he stopped me in the middle of the sentence, and he said, don't even go there. You know that God healed you, and when they go in, they're not going to find anything there. So they go ahead, they wheel me in, they go to the blood workup, they do the testing, they do the scan on my brain. And by 4.30 in the morning, somewhere around there, I'm now stabilized, I'm not vomiting anymore. And I hear the click, click, click of the curtain open up. And I hear the doctor say, well, I uh, do believe in miracles. She says, all the blood workup has come back. She said, and, and we did the scan on the brain. She said, there's no tumor there. She said, there's nothing wrong with your wife. All she has is a little gastrointestinal from something that she ate, like a food poisoning. I go ahead and I, I look and I realize, God allowed me the gift he allowed me the gift to carry that cross of suffering so that he may be glorified in it. And he also brought me an awareness of the treasure of carrying the cross. One year after we came back from Medjugorje, John and I wanted to make an anniversary Thanksgiving pilgrimage to the place where Our Lady had called us to go. And it was quite interesting because as John and I were making the plans to go, Christopher, um, who had deepened his faith to such an extent that I asked that same question to him again, I said, Christopher, are you still saying your prayers? He smiled and he looked at me. He says, Mom, you don't have to ask me that question anymore. He said, I'm not only praying in the morning. He said, and I'm praying at night, but then I find myself praying on the way to work. He said, you don't have to ask me that question anymore. And Christopher, here's John and I making these plans to go to Medjugorje. And he goes, Mom, do you mind if I go? I really have a desire to go. So on the Thanksgiving pilgrimage, John and I were accompanied by our oldest son, Brian, our middle son, Christopher. Kyle, unfortunately, was not able to go because he just started a new job. And it was at that trip I went to go back to say thank you to Our Lady, and I had no idea the depth of her motherhood. But she is like any other mother that when you go, even your own mom's, when you go up to your mom, remember when you were little and you would go ahead and you'd make a, a birthday card for her, a Valentine card or something? Your mother would come up and she'd receive and say, oh, is this so beautiful? And she'd put it up on the refrigerator and let all the relatives know that you made this card for her. Well, I found out the mother of God, even when you go back to give thanks to her, she went ahead and she brought John, Brian, Christopher, and myself in to the apparition room, into the private chapel with Yvonne, one of the other visionaries who still receives daily apparitions. 
The fact that we were even able to go in there was something that was totally orchestrated by our Lord and his mother. And as I walked in to kneel on this, or to sit on this wooden bench, I see the statue of Our Lady and this beautiful little altar area. And the visionary comes in, and at the time of his apparitions, he drops to his knees in prayer. Who is he kneeling right next to? But my son, Christopher. I cannot tell you what it did to this mother's heart. After the apparition was over with, Yvonne had asked, he shared with us about how Our Lady was very happy to see all of us there, how she had smiled at each one of us. And Yvonne had asked us whether or not we had any questions about anything. And I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit inside me to ask this question. And I, I knew the answer to this because I saw how Our Lady had worked throughout my entire my whole life in this illness through the power of prayer, through the rosary. But I said to Yvonne, I said, Yvonne, does Our Lady hear everything in your heart? You know, knowing that God hears all, sees all, and knows all. He looked at me, he smiled, he looked up, and his eyes gazed back down at me, and he said, yes. And she even goes deeper. So all those prayers that you have ever uttered in your life, where you've asked the intercession of the Blessed Mother, maybe there are some prayers that you have not even been able to formulate on your lips. She hears those prayers. A mother knows her children. Father Aniello had shared with me what the Lord had told him that day that he went and heard Jesus speaking to him in morning prayer in front of the Blessed Sacrament. He said that the Lord had told him that it would be in Medjugorje that I would be healed. And I would see the glory of God. Father didn't tell me that I was going to be healed over in Medjugorje. I understood it wasn't for me to know. It was my free choice. The free choice that God gives each and every one of us to choose if we want to follow him, to choose if we want to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit that are in every one of us. He said, you were not healed for yourself, but you were healed for your families, the community, and the world. I know that my suffering was not... I know that my suffering was not any greater than anyone else's. But I know that our God is a God whose compassion is so great for the same person who stubs his toe to the one who is undergoing chemotherapy. God's love for each and every one of you is so great that he looks at you as though you are his number one. Does God do miracles? I'm standing here bearing witness to this truth. Yes, he does. Does everybody need to make a trip over to Medjugorje? No. Not everybody's called to go. God can heal you right where you are at. You don't need to go to Medjugorje. But if you can, I encourage you to go. 
I encourage you to go. It's a beautiful spiritual pilgrimage to take. But every now and then, God does ask us this question. Will you pick up your cross and carry it for love of him? Many of you are probably sitting there now wondering whether or not the Lord is hearing what is in your heart. Is he hearing about your cancer? Is he hearing about your mother, your spouse, who is in the hospital now? Is he hearing about your, your relative who is dying? Your child who has turned away from God? Is he hearing your loneliness? I can tell you that the same God that healed me is gazing down right on each of you now in this holy tabernacle. And I know that if you pick up your cross and carry it and offer your suffering up to the Lord, he will not leave you abandoned in it. He will not And I guarantee you that if you do the same surrender that Our Lady was asking me, will you give your whole heart and your whole soul to my Son, Jesus? Will you give your whole heart and your whole soul to our Father? Will you Give your whole heart and your whole soul to my spouse, the Holy Spirit. You, who are God's son and God's daughter, you too will experience that same joy that St. Paul talks about in Scripture, that carrying the cross is a joy to the point of folly. It is through that cross, that blessed cross that is leading us to the eternal joys of heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us the treasure that lies in the cross. Thank you for opening the door You said, I am the light, the truth, and the way. Come follow me, all you who are laden with heavy burden, and I shall give you rest. Thank you so much for allowing me the gift to be able to keep a promise to Our Lady that John and I made on the Hill of the Apparitions. We made a promise to Our Lady and Our Lord that we would not be like the other lepers who did not come back to give thanks. How many times in your life did you have an opportunity to give thanks and praise to God? but did not. Do it now before your journey here on earth is over with. So I'd like to end this testimony with the two words that the visionary Vitska had said when she greeted me that day that started this incredible healing journey for the glory of God. These two words, I pray, will one day resound over the face of the earth, and that is, praise God. Thank you. Amen. I pray that the testimony that you heard, what God did in my life, will draw your heart closer to Our Lady, closer to Jesus. 
We have the greatest gift in front of us. And all we need to do is walk towards him. Take everything that you have in your lives. Start now. Don't wait till tomorrow to do it. My life was ending so quickly, and it was only by the grace of God that I was spared. Take the love that he's given in you and share that with your children. Share it with your husband. Share it with your neighbors. Share it with the community. Share it with the world. Because it is only through his love. It is only through the love and example of his mother that if we all do this, then maybe one day there will be peace on earth. Peace is the main message that Our Lady is asking for in Medjugorje. She asks each and every one of us to pray, to pray with the heart, to fast. Even if you cannot fast on bread and water, give up something that you would want to deny as a sacrifice for love of God. Pick up the Bible that you've had in your home and maybe haven't read anything in years. Go to Scripture. All the truth is there that we need in this life, the same truth that I spoke of about St. Paul. All the answers are there in the Bible. Our Lady asks us to go to confession. When is the last time we humbled ourselves to say to God, yes, I've sinned today. I've yelled. I've gossiped. I've done something else. I've been selfish. We've allowed pride to become so much a part of us that we forget to go to Almighty God and confess our sins. There's a reason why this healing took place in Medjugorje. I don't know all the answers, but I don't need to know because I know that God is in control of everything. It may be hard to think that he's in control, seeing the wars, seeing the other things that happen in our own family lives. He doesn't want us to suffer. And it is in suffering, though. It is in carrying the cross that we are redeemed. There isn't any one of us that's probably going to escape the cross. And you know what? I wouldn't want to. Because I found out that the greatest treasure I had, that I have, is in carrying the cross because it brought me closer to Jesus. And I pray that by sharing the cross of suffering that I went through, it will draw you closer to Jesus too. Thank you.